This meeting is being recorded. Very abrupt. Welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for everybody who um, is here tonight and especially to our author, Stephen. Um, we really, really appreciate you spending the time with us this evening to answer all of, I'm sure, our burning questions about the book that we've all just read. Um, ladies, if you want to go ahead and put in the chat window where you're calling from, and if you want to actually add whether you finish the book or not, that's always very interesting. <laughs> um, there's not any massive spoilers. It's not psychological thriller, uh, but uh, we might be a little bit cautious if we find out that half of you haven't finished. <laughs> um, right. I'm going to read... Um, Stephen's bio very quickly here, and then we will kick off officially. Um, just so everybody knows, if you do have questions, you're welcome to ask those live. That's always really fun. Um, or you can just pop them in the chat window and I will make sure that uh, we get them asked. Um, again, for anybody who's just come in, uh, if you wanna put in where you're calling in from, please uh, do so in the chat window. That's always interesting. Um, so Stephen Rowley, Stephen Rowley is the best-selling best author of Lily and the Octopus, a Washington Post notable book of 2016, and the editor, named by NPR and Esquire magazine as one of the best books of 2019. His new novel, The Gunkle, was hailed by O Magazine as one of the LGBT books changing the literary landscape, and it was a Goodreads Choice Awards finalist for the mm -hmm. novel of the year. Rowley's fiction has been published in 20 languages. Mm -hmm. Lily oh, I think I need to mute somebody. There we go. Lily and the Octopus is in deve de development as a feature film at Amazon Studios. The editor was optioned by 20th Century for director Greg, I'm going to say this wrong, Berlanti. Berlanti, <laughs> Did I say, okay. Feature film rights for The Gunga have been picked up by Lionsgate. Stephen has worked as a freelance writer, newspaper, columnist, and screenwriter. Originally from Portland, Maine, he is a graduate of Emerson College, and he currently resides in Palm Springs with his husband, the writer Byron Lane. Okay, so much to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for reminding me that we've chatted before for Lily and the Octopus. So it's great to be back. That's right. So we spoke in March of 2018, um, when after the group read um, Lily and the Octopus. So what's changed in the last, uh, since we spoke last? <laughs> <laughs> well, like worldwide or something? No, in your this. life specifically. <laughs> specifically in my life yeah now this is my third book so I guess this is this is what I do you know like talking to you for with for a debut novel um you know I was just so happy and and uh, it's uh something that came to me a little bit later in life you know I, Lily was published uh when I was 45 so you know I was always jealous of people who went to a prestigious writing program and published their first novel at 25 or something that was not my path but uh, you know here I am three books in and you know um, I am now married and uh, have ridden out the pandemic in Palm Springs which became such an inspiration for this book and uh, I'm actually coming to you today, though, from Portland, Maine, from my hometown where I'm visiting family and putting in time as a gunkle this week to my real life five nieces and nephews. So um, it's sort of thrilled to sort of like hit pause on that for a moment. Uh, Uncle Steve, got to go uh, pay some bills. So here I am. <laughs> awesome. Well, I mean, I feel like you answered so many questions in that like little intro there, but um, can you go back? So you were you were a journalist before you were writing full time. That's right. Yeah, I was a journalist for a while. I was a screenwriter, um, you know, in, in Los Angeles with a, a modicum of success. I, I never had anything actually made, but that's the weird thing about LA. There's so many more screenplays floating around than um, uh, uh, than than ever ever get produced. So um, you know, it was when when Lily when I had the idea for Lily, which was a deeply personal story. It's also a story about grief and grieving. You know, much like uh, the Gunkel is. But um, you know, I I was sort of frustrated waiting. You know, as a screenwriter, you're waiting always for um, you know a producer, a financier, a director, actors, to all these layers of different people saying yes. And and Lily was such a personal story that I um, just thought I might have a little more success or or 
the option to have a little more control over putting that story out into the world. And so I chose uh, to write it in a, in a novel format and that, that sort of launched a whole, a whole new career for me. Absolutely, ladies. Um, for anybody who just joined us, if you do have any questions and you'd like to ask them live, please feel free. There is a raise your hand um, functionality, um, or you can always pop them in the chat window and I will make sure that they get asked um, of Stephen. Okay, so Lily and the Octopus, it's funny because you're right. You're absolutely right. It's a huge, it's a huge story about grief. And I didn't even make that comparison because they are so very different. <laughs> um, what, so what sort of brought you to this point where you decided that this was your next book? Yeah, I, you know, I had a book in between, um, you know, Lily was a, it was a deeply personal story. It's a, it's a little odd. It's a, it's different from the Gonko and that is sort of, very, it's, um, you know, magical realism. So the style is, is a little bit different. Um, but it was such a deeply personal book uh, that I wrote very sort of honestly and to understand something that I was going through in my life. I never expected anyone to read it. I thought, ah, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I might uh, have a, be lucky with a small run if there's a couple hundred readers. Or two. But it became a national bestseller and translated in, in 20 languages. And now, as you mentioned, there's a movie in the works and all, all this sort of stuff that was a huge surprise to me. Uh, it led to me writing my second novel, the editor, which is about a young writer whose book, whose deeply personal book sort of spirals beyond his control uh, when he finds out that his editor, the editor that uh, acquires his book, what, uh, the book takes place in the early 1990s, is none other than Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, who did have a 15 year career as a book uh, as a book uh, editor and really had this sort of remarkable third act after her two marriages and so and and you know that we need to write about sort of what had happened uh in the act of publishing lily and the octopus um this novel i went back to something that that's deeply personal you know i don't have children of my own uh but i do have these five nieces and nephews and i was very struck by how uh how much these relationships meant to me and i was always sort of aware as a writer you know regardless of if you want kids or don't there's no denying that having and raising children is one of life's great emotional uh, experiences. And I was always aware as a writer and as an artist, like not having had that experience, but I did have these very special relationships with my nieces and nephews. And so um, it, it felt like, a, you know, an area that I, that I wanted to explore for sort of fertile ground to, to write from. I think that leads us really into um, my next question, which is Patrick, such an amazing character. I, I was telling Stephen before um, everybody joined that I did listen to it on Audible, or not Audible, actually, Libro FM. We've got to put that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but I did listen to it and it, it was your voice um, narrating it. And I feel like the the like humor, it really landed. And I think it's because you were telling the story. And do you have any thoughts on, well, narrating it yourself um, on, on an audio book, as an audio book? And um, well, yeah, I guess just that. <laughs> yeah, so I, we, were, we were talking a little bit earlier for those who turned in a little early. This is my first time uh, narrating an audiobook, and And by the way, uh, the publisher doesn't always think it's a good idea for the author to do this. So I had to audition uh, for the publisher. You know, I had to convince them that I would be the right man for this for this job. And so that was a very interesting experience. And once they were on board, they they uh, secured a, a recording studio uh, in Palm Springs where I live. The trouble with that though is Palm Springs is very hot, uh, you know, as you know from reading the book. And you, you have to turn off the air conditioning in the recording booth because oh. the sound, you know, the sound will be picked up from the microphone. So I would sit in the recording booth for like an hour, like sweating profusely, trying to get this story out. And then I would open the door once an hour and be like, uh, you know, try to take in some some uh, cooler air. But uh, it was, it, you know, it was a really interesting experience. And um, as I said, I don't I don't know if I will always do it. You know, it might be on a case by case basis if I feel I have a voice to give the give the character. You know, in this case, Patrick was similar enough to to me that I I I wanted to try undertaking it. And I do think it's really interesting. You know, back when I when I used to tour book yet. I wanted to hear the author's voice first so that I had that in my head when I read the book. And other people want to read the book first and say, I don't want your 
uh, interpretation coloring my, you know, reading. Uh, you know, my ability to picture the story. And put it out in the world. So it's it's interesting to have a record of how it sort of sounds in my head um, for anyone who's curious. Um, Kathy has just written here that she thinks you you reading it added another whole a whole new level to it. So <laughs> oh, that's that's really lovely to hear. I didn't know sort of how it would be received. I don't listen to a lot of audiobooks. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. the narration is a little slow for me, or I'll put them. Uh, you know, I'll change the speed of them a little bit. Um, so I wasn't sure if the way I read would, um, you know, would resonate with other people who are used to audiobooks. So, so that means a lot to me. So thank you. Okay. Now we have so many questions here. Um, one thing I did want to cover is, um, I said to Stephen when I first met him, I'm like, I can't help but think of Patrick now because I like I know Patrick so well now. <laughs> so how much of you is in Patrick, or vice versa? <laughs> Yeah, I will say, you know, I was joking. Patrick's a little younger than I am. He's got more money than I do. He just works at Dabbles in TV, which pays better than publishing. So he's got, you know, more resources than I do. But our senses of humor, you know, are definitely the same. I had to access that to, to give his, you know, to find his voice. Um, our, our empathy, our worldview, our politics are probably all very similar. Um, you know, he's, he's a little sadder than I am. He's been through some things that fortunately I have not, but, um, you know, I have great sympathy, uh, and great empathy for, for him and particularly his ability to learn and, and change. You know, I've gotten some pushback from readers about his behavior, uh, you know, particularly in the beginning of the book. And I have to always say like, well, you know, writing characters who, you know, perfect characters who behave perfectly and say the perfect thing all the time, that doesn't really make for an interesting reading experience. So you've got to give them, you know, some place to grow. And, and so he's a little, you know, he may be a little more abrasive at the beginning of the book, but um, I like how open he is to change. Uh, Denise, let's go to you. Do you want to ask a question to Stephen? Um, I, I don't, listen to the audio books can you hear me yeah i can yes oh okay lovely i must say i really really enjoyed the book and um like aaron i i like to i kind of put patrick's voice with the character that i saw in will and grace his best friend mm -hmm. is that i hope that's not an insult but i really no, enjoyed not at all. okay great so i really really enjoyed the character that way and um, I, I loved how you ended the book. Um, for those who haven't finished, I won't say anything more. Yeah, we'll talk just, a little broadly. <laughs> yeah, I was just very excited to read the book. Um, I, I talked to my children the way you talk to your to the niece <laughs> and nephew. And sometimes I thought, oh, maybe I was a little too much over their head. Maybe that's why they don't talk to me anymore. But I have to say, um, the book was really, really good and it's so exciting to be able to see you because I was going to miss out on the game on, on uh, sorry, miss out on the, uh, the discussion on Wednesday because I have another engagement. Um, mm. But I just was really happy to be able to meet you and I, I am looking forward to if there is a movie um, that I'd certainly support what you have. And it, and it really gave me an insight into the gay community um, it's not part of my life, but I'm understanding it so much more. And thank you for bringing it to the forefront. Oh, thank you. I, you know, thank you very much for that. And I would, I would love to just sort of touch on a few things you said. And yeah, the the idea that Patrick talks to these kids as you know, sort of mini adults. And and uh, I think you know, right. for many people, particularly like Clara, the sister, that you know makes him seem from the outset like maybe perhaps the very worst person to take them in for the right. summer. Whereas, you know, I think when kids are are really scared or, or frightened or go or, or sad that they don't want someone to speak down to them or treat them, you know, with kid gloves, that, that Patrick talking to them as if they were equals in a, in a way, you know, yeah. was ultimately like a strength, I think, for um, his relationship with them mm -hmm. that summer. Um, I, it, it is, the, the story is in development as, as a movie, and I hope to have more news that I can announce soon. I did write the, the screenplay, 
uh, myself. So I, I think I can say it's it's you know the things that you hopefully love about the book will be you know very much a part of a part of the movie. But I've heard from lots of people saying they they heard you know a particular a particular actor in mind when when reading it, and that's fun too. I've heard yeah Sean Hayes who was from, from Will and Grace. I've heard that a lot of a lot of Schitt's Creek fans, uh, Dan Levy fans. I've heard from yes. them as well. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, anybody who has any ideas, I, I'm, you know, I'm happy to hear that. You know, Neil Patrick Harris, I've heard a couple of times. So, you know, there's lots of great people who could, who could hopefully play Patrick, and I hope to have some news on that soon. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but thank you, thank you. And then, yeah, there are all these very beautiful now um, LGBTQ plus families raising kids, which, um, you know, there are a lot of diverse families now in a way that weren't visible when I first came out, you know, say 30 mm -hmm. years ago or so. And uh, sadly, you know, sadly, we're in a, a place in, in this country um, where, you know, those, a lot of those families are, are under attack uh, right now and a lot of our rights are in danger. And so um, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to speak up for those families because I think, you know, th there's, there's real beauty and there's real love there. Yeah. Cheers. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I wish you, you all the, all the luck in the world, Stephen. Cheers. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm talking to myself. Um, I'm going to come to you next, Angelica. Um, let me see here. Hi, I'm Angelica. Um, oh, I'm in Washington. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, no, no. It, it happens all the time. It's okay. You didn't know. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C. And I have to tell you, like, your book, oh, like, I, I love this book. Like I, I had to know what was going to happen next. I literally had to pause it when like he got served those papers <laughs> from Clara. And I was like, I got to get this air and done like now. I got to go back and I got to listen to Gunkle. And you should say I wasn't expecting him to handle it that I would not handle it that way. I am reactionary. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and I felt like he would have been too, but when he like, when he sat down in like that, I don't know what it was at the pool. I don't remember what it was called, but when he was like, what is going on? And I was like, oh, that's his sister. He knows that that's, this is not normal. Like she's neurotic, but like, she's not and right. But she's not, this is, she's not cruel. And so I really loved seeing that happen and seeing her deflation a little bit because like someone's asking her about herself and yeah. someone's checking in on her right and um and i i appreciated those uh those com that conversation that they had a lot and uh christmas in july my friend jen and i both want like i don't even know <laughs> did you I yeah, I think more or less. That's I what I was picturing at least. Ones that they had at Target, remember, like a couple of years ago. I want like a giant one in my apartment right now. Like we were both just like Christmas in July sounds like a fantastic idea right now. So um all that to say, like, thank you for writing this book. Like I love how I love how Patrick talks to his niece and nephew. I try and talk to my little cousins like that. Um, <laughs> You know, because like they're not dumb, they're just young, they're just kids, right? So I don't have to baby voice them, I don't have to, I can talk to them like people. Um, and so I just thoroughly enjoyed, like, the kids seemed like foreign to him, but also like they, and they felt like he was kind of foreign, I feel like, but then they felt yeah. safe enough with him to go sleep in his room at night, right? Like, to go sleep, like sneak in, and I and I loved how if he if someone asked a question, he's like, I don't know, like he was just like, I don't know, why would you? What kind of question is this? <laughs> and so all of these very realistic conversations that you could see happening that I've had, that I you know my friends have told me they've had with their kids, it was just so nice and it flowed really well and it made me smile all the time and I wish I would have bought it instead of checking it out at the library not that I can't buy it <laughs> not that I can't buy it but like 
you know, it's kind of like a, it's a book that I want to listen to again and again. And I oh, really thank you. Well, I, one thing like yeah. Christmas in July, we got a few days left. So if anyone wants to put up their tree, listen, there's not a lot of joy always. So find it where you can. You got a few days left. Uh, two, um, uh, you know, I've already wait. I've already lost what I was going to say. But, oh, Clara, I have a soft spot for Clara. You know, and I'm visiting my two sisters. Uh, this week and they both you know as i was coming uh you know to do this event tonight they were they were, wanted me to remind you that they are not clara they're not the inspiration for clara <laughs> but i do have a soft spot for her. you know clearly she's going through some things of her own and i always think that's more interesting than writing like stock villains um is to write uh pain you know people in pain who are going through some things and you know she has legitimate concerns it's not a slam dunk that patrick's the right person uh, for the job, you know, at the outset of this. And I think, you know, she's right to be concerned a little bit. She doesn't always handle it the best way, but, you know, the Patrick reacting the way he did is, is hopefully, a, a, you know, the marker of, of a real change in him and, and the ability where we, we you know, to grow and where we see that growth um, really for the, for the first time. So, um, you know, uh, I'm grateful for that. It's, it's interesting to write about siblings too you know there's a lot of threes in the story so patrick and the two kids and then patrick and greg and and clara are you know uh, you know three there's literally three some across the wall in in bed and then there's in law the kid's mother and and joe in a way were you know back in the day so it's interesting you know sometimes when there's there's three characters uh, the way the the loyalties and the um frictions can can change over time. Thanks for your question. Um, if anybody else wants to ask one live, then please just uh, use the raise your hand functionality. Otherwise, we have so many coming up here in the chat. Um, Don wants to know, what do your nieces and nephews think of the book? Are Maisie and Grant based in part on any of them specifically? Uh, yeah, I, well, so they're all still a little young to read it on the young side. The book is dedicated to them. Uh, so to the extent that I stole anything from their lives, you know, I feel, you know, hopefully they'll forgive me. I do feel for any of you, if you're related to writers or no writers, because be careful, we're sponges. We will, uh, we will absorb all these, you know, details that are, you know, you need to put in a book that makes it feel sort of rich and alive. Um, that uh, Maisie and Grant are not like, there's not like a one-to-one -one correlation to my uh, nieces and nephews. There is a, a few things, uh, you know, you know, combined uh, perhaps, and then some children of some friends and, you know, things I'm observed and a little bit of me maybe when I was a kid too, um, that I had to access in, in writing them. But it was super fun to write, write them as kids. And, and um, the, the scenes, their scenes with Patrick are, are some of my favorites. Um, just to expand on this question, Kathy actually wants to know if your nieces and nephews get to call you Gunkle, <laughs> and do you have Gunkle rules? <laughs> they do now, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes as a joke. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I don't, I haven't like sort of dictated hard and fast rules the way, the way Patrick does, but I certainly have, you know, my own philosophies in, in raising kids. Um, fortunately, they align with uh, my siblings and their and their partners and spouses, so that um, I uh, I don't have to intercede with my own uh, you know with my own viewpoint that much. Um, but you know I they would they would absolutely align with Patrick. It was an interesting way for me to um, imagine what I might be like as a parent and what I think would be important to pass on. Um, and so those rules, while some of them are very silly, some of them are are truly um, I think hopefully hopefully meaningful. Um, and so they were, they, you know, they were a lot of fun to, to add. Speaking of meaningful, one of the, um, characters, characters, plural here, um, that I enjoyed the most was Jed. Um, and I was excited mm -hmm. whenever one of them showed up. Um, they just always seemed to bring such insight to the, to the story. Um, was that always, was that really intentional? Um, can you talk a little bit about those three characters? Yeah, I really, I mean, I adore Jed. I'm, I love that other people love them too. I wasn't sure at first if this would just be, you know, uh, just the, you know, a stone's throw too far for, for some readers. Um, but the fact that people have really embraced them as characters is, is uh, you know, has been a real surprise and a delight 
to me because I, I like them. I mean, you know, part of the fun in that is taking something that could be a punchline and subverting expectations a little bit and making them really serious, serious minded and lovely, generous and loving people. Um, and, uh, you know, I have known a few relationships like this. I don't know that it would be the relationship model for me uh, necessarily, but that's one of the joys of being a writer is you can put yourself in other people's shoes a little bit and, and play, imagine what that, what that might be like. But uh, yeah, I really enjoy them. And, uh, you know, it, Patrick has a few quips in there at their expense, but they are, you know, hopefully very well-rounded and, and fun uh, individuals. But, you know, to, to a certain extent, the story is a fish out of water story for the kids as well. So I thought, okay, what might they see in the hippie-ish California desert that they might, you know, not encounter necessarily in uh, suburban Connecticut? And so um, they were they were a lot of fun to sort of toss into the mix. Um, the earthquake, is that like, the earthquake, is that very typical of Palm Springs? Do you have a lot of earthquakes? <laughs> Um, we have a few. So I, I do live there in Palm Springs now. I, did, I actually didn't live there. Uh, uh, I've been sort of a long time visitor. But, um, I've had a house there that was kind of like a, a rental property for us for a while, and then a, a weekend place for us to get away from Los Angeles where we lived. And um, But, but uh, you know, after writing the book, I was like, you know, I think I really like Palm Springs and would like to be there uh, full time. This is now the hardest time of year uh to be there because it is it is unrelentingly hot as it is in the you know in the book for uh you know the summer that they're there this is not not the on season uh as it were but um yeah there's a few earthquakes i've experienced uh a number of them since being in southern california i do remember one in particular i was sitting on my couch facing the glass doors looking out at my swimming pool and i could see the water like sloshing side to side like just about to spill over the edge um, so they happen, um, uh, they're not, uh, monthly occurrences or thank goodness, uh, you know, otherwise I might reconsider a little bit, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, part of life in Southern California a little bit. So, um, okay. Let's talk about Sarah. Um, obviously uh, a very important character, although mostly absent during most of the most of the book. But have I got this right? She was based on a friend that you actually lost to breast cancer. Yeah, and that happened while I was writing the book. You know, I think I started thinking that this was going to be more of an outright comedy. You know, I was looking at Auntie Mame. Uh, for anyone who knows that story, you know, it was a 1950s uh, novel by Patrick Dennis, and then a it was a, a, a movie and then a Broadway musical and then a movie musical. And, you know, that's had a long story, a long history. I've loved, you know, Sound of Music and Mary Poppins and, you know, all this sort of magical caregiver genre. And I thought it would be fun to create sort of a queer entry in that space. Um, but I was imagining more of an outright comedy and, and, you know, and I think the book is still funny, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like a, a month or two into the writing process, I did lose my, you know, one of my best friends from college to breast cancer and, and she left behind a six year old son. So that was, uh, you know, it got me thinking about grief in children in a much more serious way. You know, Mame had sort of shipped her her ward, her nephew that she inherited off to boarding school. And it sort of sidestepped that issue of, of grief and grieving. And I, I, I very much did not want to do that uh, in this story. And so even though Patrick only has them for the summer, you know, and they're not, it's not like, you know, grief is something that's an open-ended uh, journey and experience. And so I, I never mean to suggest that by the end of the summer, these kids are okay in many ways. You know, Patrick is a distraction for the summer and they're just going to begin their true grieving and healing process when they return home. But um, I wanted to explore grief sort of head on. Um, and hopefully it's sort of that balance between, um, you know, this sort of earnest, um, heartfelt discussion of, of grief balanced with the, with the comedy is, is um, what makes the book hopefully soar. Um, you talk about sort of like the timeline for grieving and, and I mean, Patrick was dealing with his own grief over something that he had shut, like how long had Joe been gone? Four years? I think it's more like nine, eight or nine years in the book. Okay. Yeah. 
So yeah, and that's a, that's an interesting thing for, for Patrick to realize, you know, that his grief journey is not the one that he wants mm -hmm. for the kids necessarily, that he really shot himself down or shot himself away from the world. And I think, he, you know, he realizes early on that that would, you know, that's not what he wants for the kids. And so the way to, um, the best way to help avoid that is, is to lead by example. And hopefully, you know, it, it's interesting that this book came out in, in May of, of 2021. So, so like, as like vaccines were a thing for the first time and, you know, we'd all been sort of self-isolating in a way for the year prior to that. And, and, you know, it's just coincidence that I'd written this book about a character who's also been isolating away and is finding his way back into the light and that it, you know, came out when it did, you know, I think we're all, we're all grieving a little bit now, you know, whether it be, you know, truly if any of us lost anyone, you know, in the past couple of years of the pandemic or, or, or lost time or lost togetherness, you know, there is, we've missed a lot, you know, as a culture. And so it's just a sort of interesting timing to the book that I could not have, not have really, uh, you know, imagined when writing it. Uh, do you think that that helped you personally, um, writing about um, losing Sarah in the story and going through that at the same time yourself? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm afraid I'm a little bit like Patrick in that I did, I was able to write about it and that helped, you know, sort of in the initial part. And then there's, there are other parts where I thought, oh, I threw myself into the book and I, I actually do now, you know, miss my friend terribly. And I'm like, I wonder if I, if I kind, you know, in kind of like working it, working it out through Patrick, if there's parts of it I haven't worked through myself yet. And it is, you know, there are days when I realize like, oh God, that's not, you know, and I want to call her still or, or, um, you know, it still strikes me that she's, she's not here. And, and so, you know, it is interesting how, you know, it's, it's been a couple of years now. So it's interesting how open-ended um, and surprising, you know, grief can be. And it's not, not something you're cured from. It's something you kind of learn to live with and make peace with. And, um, and uh, you know, hopefully it helps you appreciate uh, the time that you have here and the, and the relationships and telling people who are here, you know, how much they mean to you while, while you still can. And what an amazing gift. I'm just thinking here, like Suze has written here. She, she writes, full admission. I have not actually cried in a book since Dolby died in Harry Potter. This <laughs> is the most precious, kind, loving book about grief and healing. She loved, loved, loved it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to sort of craft these conversations in a way that children can understand them. And I think there's so many ways in which adults, like we're also trying, we're just trying to understand. And so even breaking it down in a, in a slight, slight childlike way is, is helpful to adults sometimes because we don't stop and, and um, you know, really, really um, break down that process for ourselves. Uh, I think I got a lot of emails actually of people saying they're going through, everybody's going through something always, but, and, and like, because grief, like you said, it stays with us for so long. I feel like we're always dealing with it because most of us, if you've never lost anybody, it's very unusual. So most of us are, are dealing with it on some level or another. So um, there's so many one liners from your book that are just like so spot on and like really, really profound. So, but then it's, 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 given to us sort of like in this like light playful um with a lot of humor which is just a really nice way to sort of like work through it <laughs> well remember when i told you i like mary poppins you know to me that's the spoonful of sugar you know that helps that medicine yeah, that's and <laughs> uh you know and that's definitely something that i was conscious of in writing it you know all the stories that i've loved you know growing up too are that have that real balance of humor and uh and heartbreak in that way and it, you know in a project like this it's it's truly it's balancing those two things you know it's the hardest it's the hardest part you know like i would go through scenes almost surgically and sometimes there's a you know one joke too many and it throws off the whole balance of what you're trying to do and conversely if you go too long without allowing the reader to take a breath you know with a joke you know the book becomes too heavy and so it's really it's really surgical sometimes finding finding that balance um and, um, you know, to the extent that readers are, are responding to the book, it's, you know, it's very gratifying. Well, we need to know if the Toto scene has any, any um, place in reality. <laughs> if, the, if the what? The, the oh, toilet. The, with the or the, what was it called? Oh, the, the, the toilet. Yeah, the, the washlet. 
the uh, yeah. No, I don't. Everyone asks me, do you have this? Do you have this washlet? Do you have this toilet in your house? I, no, I do not. I've not. I've actually been sent a number of caftans and cool floats and things like that, but no one has thought to send me a $20,000 uh, toilet. <laughs> but, you know, I, I feel for crime writers and the horror, horror or thriller writers because, you know, all I was doing research is because all I was doing was Googling, uh, you know, research on the, on this toilet. And now every sponsored ad I would get, you know, in my social media feed was for very expensive, you know, porcelain bathroom <laughs> items. And so I was like, what happened if I Googled like how to get rid of a body? Like, I don't know, like what the internet would think of me then. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was very interesting. And, you know, in some ways it was like, um, you know, I know kids are, you know, certainly my experience with my nieces and nephews is sometimes toilet humor is something that kids are into. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna write it quite in, you know, at, as bodily functions, but I might like literally the toilet will be uh, the toilet itself will be <laughs> something that I can uh, draw some humor. From. Um, I read it to my husband because he's a plumber, so I thought he would find that. Oh, <laughs> 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 maybe he knows where I get a discount on. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> photos are expensive. I know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's let's change sort of uh, speeds a little bit and talk about, so your partner Byron is actually also an author. I would love to know what that experience is like. Do you both work from home? Do you read each other's work? Is it helpful? Is it hard? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, some people were like, that must be such a nightmare. And, you know, <laughs> certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, I, I'm, you know, I know a lot of writers who are married to like, you know, uh, high-powered corporate executives or attorneys or somebody and I was like I can imagine them invading their personal workspace and being on like loud conference calls all day or or you know at least our house is quiet which is conducive to writing um, but there are challenges certainly you know there are professional jealousies to navigate there are we do read each other's work and that so I have to sometimes you know, into it. Are you asking me to read this as a, as a writer, as a colleague, as a husband, as a partner? You know, are you looking for notes? Are you looking for support, encouragement? Uh, so, you know, that's sort of the hard part to to navigate sometimes. But I think um, I think we have done it as best as we possibly can, and it's it's fun. We've been able to do a few events together. Um, and that's always that's always joyful. He was for years uh, the personal assistant to the actress and writer Carrie Fisher, oh, um, and his he wrote a novel called A Star Is Bored, which is based on uh, you know inspired by their friendship. It is a novel, but it's inspired by their friendship. And so if you like the heart and the humor that was in in the Gunkel, um, I, I think his work has has a similar balance. Oh wow, that's very cool. Yes, we'll look into that for sure. Um. Linda wants to know, she said she really loved the Gunkel rules. Are some of these rules that you do live by? Are there, I guess, are some of these rules ones that you live by? Yeah, I mean, I think I do live by a number of them. I don't think I've articulated them so clearly uh, before. <laughs> some of my favorites are, are the silliest, you know, uh, bottomless mimosas aren't the same as pantless mimosas, <laughs> you know, so, you know, adjust your behavior accordingly in a restaurant. Um, uh, so, you know, some of them were to amuse myself, but, you know, they're, they're truly, um, really lovely, uh, ones as well. And so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll think, we'll think I still, I still write them down. You know, I have a notes app in, uh, on my phone, which is where, you know, when I come across something that I think would be a gunkle roll, I'm still keeping track of them, uh, mm -hmm. now. So, you know, maybe I'll use a few, a few in real life as well. Oh, sorry. Uh, Kathy wants to know your husband's name again so that she can find his book. I have Byron Lane, L-A-N-E, and the book is A Star is Bored. And uh, that actually came from, he traveled the world with Carrie and, uh, you know, they would they would march up the steps of this incredible temple in, you know, Japan or wherever. She'd take one look and be like, I'm bored. And they would <laughs> want to go back to the hotel. That's cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to just revisit the um, the television movie place right mm -hmm. now because I know all three have been optioned and I know that doesn't mean anything because they could always still be a long way from seeing anything on TV. But how, like, are we going to see, is there any definite plans to see any of your books on the screen or is it all still up in the air? You know, I hate to say definite. I've worked in Hollywood enough 
you know, a long enough time that, you know, I'll never say, ne I'll never say definite until it's actually up on the, on the screen. Sure. I will say, um, yes, they're all in active development. They are, you know, it's almost neck and neck to the screen. I wouldn't be surprised if the, if we see the Gunkel first, even though it was, you know, the most recent book in that, um, you know, we have a script, we've, you know, we're making great progress and, and, you know, you get Patrick and the kids in the house and it's, it's almost the easiest to, uh, to film and get up there on the screen. So, um, I'm very hopeful that, um, we could have something in production within the next six, nine months or so. So fingers yeah. crossed. That would yeah. be amazing. We all, we've seen, we've had a couple of books that we read like Pachinko and a couple of books actually go to movie and it's always like such a big deal. Yeah, and Pachinko is extraordinary. It's so beautiful, so right. beautiful. Um, that's a really lovely adaptation because they're not always, they're not always no. <laughs> beautiful adaptations, but they did a really extraordinary job. Of it. Karen has a question she'd like to ask live, so we'll let her do that. Oh, yes. I um, was thinking about how reading has changed with e-readers. Like one of us commented in the chat that uh, listening to your uh, wonderful voice on the audiobook it took longer to puzzle out who Jed was. And I'm mm -hmm. um, an e-reader now myself. And and I find that my reading is very different when I'm on the e-reader because I'm clicking through, you know, I'm clicking through to Rosalind Russell. I'm clicking through to Auntie mm -hmm. May. And so I did want to say that I I loved, I, I clicked through to your Instagram and then I got to see all these fellows in caftans. And that was <laughs> amazing um we just spent the fourth at a we were honored to be invited to our friend's pool party which was uh over half uh gay men and so now i'm like i have to buy them two m turk caftans uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh so i wondered how you prefer to read and um and also wanted to recommend that you start with the 200 dollar bio debate a bidet a toilet mm -hmm. seat add-on and then see how much you love that and if you want to save for Toto. If which I want to upgrade I'm, from there, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, that's very kind. Yeah, I have I have drafted a lot of my friends, put them in caftans and made them a uh, model for my Instagram page. Uh, you know, I didn't have to twist anyone's arm too, too hard to do that. Um, and if you follow me, um, I'm at Mr. MR Stephen Rowley. Um, I, I think we're doing an upcoming um, promotion with a captain company, so there'll be discounts and stuff like that. I'll be announcing that in the next couple of weeks. Um, but uh, yeah, it's you know it's a lot of fun. I do have a closet full of captains. Everyone's always surprised I'm not wearing one when I do a bookstore appearance or you know a Zoom event, and I'm like, you know, I, being a writer at home, like I I actually have the opportunity to wear clothes now for an event. Like I I never get to wear these <laughs> when it is so hot, you know, in the summer particularly. So. Um, so sometimes I actually like to get dressed, uh, but you know, it's great fun. And I, and I read, I read in, in multiple ways. I, I still love paper. Um, you know, I, anything that gets me away from a screen, cause I spend so much of my time writing, you know, at a laptop. So, um, but I'm traveling now, so I do have my Kindle with me and, um, you know, it's so helpful. I used to judge, you know, traveling, like what book to bring based on how much it weighed, which is a terrible <laughs> way to select reading material, but you know, um, so I'm grateful for my e-reader. Um, I, I still have paper, to, especially to read by the pool in the summer. I'm afraid of dropping my Kindle in the pool or it's so hot, you know, it's, you know, it's 105 degrees in Palm Springs, you know, right now. So like, you know, the Kindle will overheat very quickly in the way that a book doesn't. So uh, it's a balance for, you know, it's a balance for me. And I, I often have, a, a you know, a book going on, on both. And so depending on where I am in the house or what's within reach, you know, particularly I have a puppy now too. It's the puppies that sleep, I, whatever I can reach from where I'm sitting, because I don't. I'm like, oh, finally, you know, <laughs> so. Oh, and I love seeing the pies. It's worth um, getting out on Instagram just to see the gunkel uh, rendered in pie dough uh, and clicking. Yeah, it. it's really lovely it, account. It, um, I, I wish I could take uh, credit for that. I think it's pie lady books mm -hmm. um, is her, is her account. Um, and so uh uh, she's she's great. She's an incredible lover of books and supporter of authors, and she create recreates these book covers in in pie dough, and it, it it's really really extraordinary. She's great. And I think it's at Pie Lady Books. 
And I'm thinking, you know, David Sedaris, I've seen in some pretty ridiculous pants, uh, trousers. Ah, um, he loves his so, like later hosen and things. Yeah. Yeah. And these Japanese kind of like culottes, mm -hmm. basically. So yeah. maybe oh, the culottes, captain, yeah. you could try it. <laughs> I could. Yeah. Well, I've got, I definitely have it going with the, with the, with the, uh, caftans and also on Instagram, I think if you scroll back away, there's a, there's a tour, a video tour of my caftan closet. So that was fun to do as well. So I just, to wrap up, I do want to ask you, uh, if you have any book recommendations for us, um, if we loved the Gunkel, what should we read? Um, also what are you reading just out of curiosity? Uh, if you can <laughs> let us know. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading a book right now called the mid coast, uh, by, I think it's Adam white. Um, he, uh, I should look up his name because now I'm not 100% sure. Um, but anyhow, it's about uh, Mid Coast Maine, where I where I'm visiting uh, right now. So so you know that was fun to read. You know, oftentimes when I you know when I was writing the editor and I I was doing so much research to put Jacqueline Onassis in in a book, I was very interested in in real life you know uh, uh, fiction writers who have included you know historical figures in their in their fiction. And uh, I, as soon as I was done that book, I, that's all I wanted to read because I wanted to see how other authors uh, handled that challenge, you know. And after writing The Gunkle, it's I'm trying to find, you know, comedic uh, novels that have some pathos or, or some, some uh, heartfelt emotion uh, in them as well. Um, you know, so I, less by Andrew Sean Greer. You don't need me to recommend yeah, that. That's, we read you know, that in book club. Actually. But the sequel is coming. You know, he's releasing a sequel in September, I think. So I'm very excited uh, to read that. Um, there's a book called um, Everyone in This Room Will Someday Be Dead, which is a daunting title by Emily Austin. Um, but it's a wonderful novel about social anxiety and sort of having, you know, and, and it, you know, to the extent, again, you know, like I was mentioning earlier that we've all been more at home or more isolated or more dealing with each other on the computer, like as we are back out uh, in the world a little bit, dealing with people like the anxiety that can sometimes come from that. It's also very funny, um, like like the gunk hole, uh, hopefully, you know, Byron's book, if you're looking for something that's like, uh, like the gunk hole. And there's a wonderful um, that I found very funny, a book called Better Luck Next Time by a writer named Julia Claiborne Johnson. And it's about a, you know, different subject. It's about a, a divorce ranch uh, in, the, in Reno, Nevada in the 1930s where women would establish residency to get, to get quickie divorces uh, from their husbands for these mm -hmm. women living on a, on a, a basically a dude ranch uh, in Nevada together. And uh, there's a lot of humor and, and heart in, in women finding second chances. So that's been a lovely one I've read, I've read recently too. Um, we actually read Andrew's book in book club. Um, when yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, but um, I didn't know there was another one coming out. So thank you for <laughs> letting me know that. Yeah, sequel coming very soon, just a couple weeks. He got a he got a Pulitzer for his first one, didn't he? He got a what? Uh, yeah, Pulitzer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my last question for you is: Can you tell us anything about what's next in form, like not from to not from the screen, but from a book perspective? Yeah, I just last week before I came on this trip, turned in a new novel uh, to my editor. Um, right now, it is called The Celebrants. Okay. As in people who celebrate uh, The Celebrants. Uh, and it should be out in May of 2023. So look for that. I don't, I don't like to say a lot about it, but I will say I was inspired by, um, I don't know if anybody will remember this, the movie The Big Chill, uh, yeah. which was movie from the 1980s uh, about college friends sort of reuniting after the death of one of their own. And so, you know, um, it's, it's sort of an updated version of that. It was, you know, I rewatched the movie earlier during the pandemic and, you know, it's a little bit about middle-aged ennui and, you know, what will the back half of our lives look like? And everyone is 35 years old. I was like, what? <laughs> That's not middle-aged anymore. So <laughs> we're aging up the characters a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm in my early 50s. So. Um, we're just reimagining this a little bit and uh, I'm excited for that to come out next year. And and who knows, I'm not announcing anything, uh, you know, definitively. I will say The Gunkle is the first book I've ever written where I can imagine, uh, you know, another book and a sequel perhaps. Um, so I've missed these characters and, you know, writing the screenplay again and revisiting them, um, you know, there's, there is definitely part of me, as I said, they're just they're just kind of starting their grief journey at the end of the book. And I, I kind of want to check in with them a few years down the line and 
make sure these kids are okay. So we'll see. Oh, wow. Well, that we will keep an eye out for, for sure. What that's that it fills me with lots of hope. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank Yay. you so much for your time. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, everybody I'm sure we'll finish now. You haven't spoiled anything. So everybody is safe. Thank you, Ariana, for posting all the links as, um, Stephen, as Stephen talked. Oh my God, there's a link for the celebrants. I didn't even know that existed yet. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Ariana, for posting that. You're breaking news to me. Uh, uh, and we hope to speak to you again in, uh, next time we read one of your books, which I hope won't be too soon, too long. I, I'm always thrilled to join you. And I, I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful. I know, you know, and not even everyone who's been here, but on Instagram, I've been tagged in a lot of things from the local chapters and, and different, uh, you know, gloss uh, groups, uh, you know, that I've seen. And so I, everyone who, who tags me, I try to like and comment. I've been on deadline, so it's been hard to hit everybody, but I'm so grateful uh, for your engagement and, and um, all of your kind comments and, and enthusiasm for this book. So thank you. Well, best of luck with everything. All right. I can't wait to talk again. <laughs> I know I'm confident we will. Bye ladies. Have a good night. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.